When I was first asked by Art Access to do a presentation for National Clay Week, I considered a few different ways industry could be interpreted in a larger conversation. While I had considered an alternative spin on this dialogue, being my invitation was initiated around a specific body of work, I decided to focus on that series and its evolution. A couple of decades ago, I was pretty heavily rooted in wood firing and the building of environmental kilns. Like most of us that get sucked into the allure of this process, I wanted nothing more than to build and fire kilns for the duration of my life. Living in Northern California at the time, Humboldt County specifically, this fit into the ethos of that environment seamlessly. It was an environment of artists and makers, content being isolated and focusing on the betterment of themselves and their community. But when I made the decision to go to the East Coast for graduate school, the romanticized aspect of this process quickly changed for me. There are a few issues I've always had with wood firing, and this is still valid today. One, you can put a mediocre piece into the kiln and have it come out super sexy. Two, a large majority of what wood kilns produce is what I lovingly refer to as doo-doo brown. Three, the layperson doesn't connect with the objects prior to the changes that occur during the firing. Four, there has been little change or advancement in the development of this process since its advent, which arguably is both the beauty and tragedy of it. And five, the aspect of community, quote unquote, and its devotion to controlling fire is what advanced civilization and separated us as a species on the most primal level. Yet few people have made the element itself a focal point of their work. I don't know anyone from the ceramics community that went to graduate school at Rutgers University, and rightly so. The school isn't one that is interested in how well you make something, rather what you have to say about it. And they have a historical connection to the fluxes movement and the happenings. Alan Capra orchestrated a number of these happenings at George Siegel's farm on a regular basis. Coming from a very communal environment, I was interested in this approach to making, something similar to firing kilns in terms of the process, and the involvement of a group of individuals participating in a larger thing. This really got me thinking about my work overall in a more performative sense, and it set me on a new path that included installations and paintings with unfired clay. It opened up multiple series and explorations for me, most of which were ephemeral. This pursuit continues for me even today, but at some point, I miss my connection with some of the processes that informed my sensibilities over the years. Running the program at Rutgers after receiving my MFA, I wanted to share with my students the one thing that most of us participating in this process love more than anything, the fire. At that point, I had an epiphany and one that helped me redefine the process of firing by approaching it as a happening. From then on, my goal was to focus on these firings as events and to create a quote-unquote stage for firing one that focused on the process in an attempt to capture all the idiosyncratic minutia that makes the experience what it is. I had the luxury of teaching at a major research institution that, in addition to a vibrant and cerebral arts program, also had a ceramic engineering department that was in the process of phasing out and moving into fiber optics. Through this, I acquired an array of industrial materials and equipment that had been used by the program over the years. I began really pushing the limitations of these objects, designed by industry that withstand extreme abuse, and I got a chuckle out of using such an archaic and medieval process like wood firing to create this juxtaposition. Initially starting with industrial crucibles, I utilized the hikidashi process as a way to see just how much they could actually tolerate. Needless to say, some fared better than others in holding up to the environment based of course on their material composition. Continuing to dabble with various industrial objects like old saggers and kiln shelves, I found it ironic the industrial objects always seemed more interesting to me than the actual work that I was making. It then occurred to me that making anything at all was somewhat futile. The residual of fire and the event itself is what interested me more than the objects that I had been creating to go into the environment, and they were essentially just an excuse for me to partake in the firing process. I engaged in various explorations, everything from framing the interior spaces of the kiln walls and photographing them to documenting the sand on the floor after each firing, reminiscent to me of a hybrid between color filled painting and Buddhist sand drawings. I even made efforts to collaborate with peers by doing more performative slash earthwork type pieces where we would dig outside of a hill and fire it, yet I still felt I could do more to convey this information about the firing itself to the layperson. The culmination occurred in an international wood firing event in Estonia. Why not use bathroom furniture as a vehicle to document this happening? Everybody knows these objects and has a connection to them. They are vessels. They hold water and, in a sense, are ceremonial. The transformation would be clearly accessible to everyone. Being a fan of Duchamp and Dada, and ironically enough even sharing his birthday, this approach seemed to make a lot of sense as a vein to explore, and it provided me with many positive and unexpected results. Building and firing wood kilns for years at this point, I knew how to get the results I wanted with work. I'd salvaged Volca stacks, fissuring apart in the firebox, been tested time and again in different venues, and understood the nature of fire and how to control it, and that part was a non-issue. 
but the introduction of these porcelain objects created all kinds of new questions for me. The most intriguing part of the kiln deconstructing and reassembling these objects was the fact that for the first time in my life, I viewed the wood kiln itself as a maker instead of simply a painterly way to achieve a surface treatment. I saw this as the purest way for sculpture to be made, an element as author and my role essentially mediator putting these disparate entities together into a somewhat controlled environment. Many of the pieces that didn't end up refusing together would end up in totally different parts of the kiln and or with a completely different surface and color. The next logical progression seemed to be to work as an archaeologist slash museum conservator and reassemble the shards I could salvage. With the already present homage to the Asian aesthetic and ceremonial vessels, I figured why not one-up it, finish it with a pseudo-Americanized bastardization of Kintsugi, and so I did. I'd like to be very transparent with the fact that I didn't enjoy this process by any means. It was arduous and labor-intensive, and detail-oriented work has never been my bag. But I feel artists need to sometimes allow their work to go through the appropriate cycle and progression, even if that means doing something you aren't necessarily excited about doing. Because that's art, in my opinion. Doing what needs to be done to advance a greater dialogue the work is attempting to engage in. What I hope people glean from watching this is even within the most archaic processes and disciplines, there is always room for reinvention and pushing the boundaries of what is deemed as acceptable. And while confusion and even combativeness may ensue, remember that this stance is primarily from the uninformed viewer. It's necessary to get the looks of confusion and disgust to know that what you're doing is in fact resonating with people in some way, even when it means making them uncomfortable.